Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we've been working on this project for the last few weeks, four weeks, I would say. Um, and we started off like, you know, uh, ideating, working on a crypto to crypto exchange. Uh, however, you know, because of time scope creep and time limitations, we've, we've developed a fully functioning wallet, uh, which is again, 0.1 version. So we've got a good skeleton, <laughs> good bones, uh, I would say. Uh, and, you know, maybe the UI needs some work over time and I think we'll be, be able to do that. Uh, so yeah, uh, we can start with the documentation. Do you want to uh, give a nice overview about what we do and you sure. know what, what sort of... So, yeah. Right, yeah, so what is what problem is this trying to solve, right? Like why, why do this? Um, basically, the infrastructure for exchanges really sucks at the moment. It's really complicated to use. Um, there's 1,500 coins, but most exchanges will only list 100 or possibly 200. So sort of the point of doing this is to sort of fill that gap, right? Fill that infrastructure gap. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, uh, that's why we did it. We also have, um, you know, a few um, sort of definitions if you all want to take a look at, you know, what just simple stuff that would work. Um, going going to the tech, um, this is what we've used effectively. It's just a Django-based um, full stack framework um, with, with Postgres in the back and as a database. We're also using Redis uh, to work with uh, the background tasks that we have. Uh, basically fetching information from the blockchain and updating our Postgres persistence storage. Uh, and yeah, we've used Bootstrap in the front front end, um, which was kind of, you saw what the glance was earlier. Uh, see, uh, like, like, like I initially mentioned earlier, you know, our, our initial goal was to build a fully functioning, uh, you know, exchange. And we, we did a lot of research as to how to build an exchange and, you know, what sort of an order book is and, you know, actually Oliver implemented an order book uh, in the terminal trader style and we were trying to port that, but it, it became too big for us to um, do it. And, we just ran out of time. Yeah, we ran out of time. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to move on to, this is all boring stuff, I'm just going to move on to how it looks. Um, I think that would be nicer for everyone. Um, so yeah, do you want to? Yeah, so this is the wallet home page. Once I, uh, first of all, a uh, user have to first uh, log in and uh, first has to log in, uh, registering with this uh, user ID and password. And uh, then there is this uh, 2FA authentication and after that we come to this uh, wallet part. Wallet part is exclusively for the users. And uh, here we show the different, uh, different we show the generalized uh, total Bitcoin BTC value with the approximate user dollar value, which is a conversion. We get this user dollar va uh, value from the wrapper and the, which is fetched by the model and then the view and then comes to the front end and the withdrawal limit which we have free, uh, free still just, now. Just a point on the USD value, we're not, there's no USD trading on the exchange so we're taking an average from other exchanges that do trade USD, right? Yeah, we're using an API for yeah. it to, to convert uh, basically the every coin that the user has in our wallet. So right now we have, say for example this user has 0.02 Litecoin and you know it has 100 Bitcoin for example you know it's taking both these values converting them to USD and adding them together and putting it up there so, so it's, yeah and we're basically taking an average so like you know how you we check coin market cap or crypto compare so we've used an API for that like uh, we've wrapped it into can you sign off and then start from the first sure So we are signing out. This is our home page. Nothing much in there. So actually, give up for sign up. So when we sign up, we sign up using the username, uh, password, and uh, the email. Where the username will uh, these all are handled by the Django firm applications, and uh, so username uh, have to be different. It has to be unique. These all are handled on the back side. So once we once we have registered it, it uh, waits for the confirmation from the user. An email will be sent. Uh, those complicated steps uh, we have put it up in the back. So an email will be sent, and once the email is verified, 
uh, you will be able to access, you will be getting the full privileges of your user. So currently we are, what we are showing you is like how we do it in the admin side. Now, uh, the admin side we will be verifying the user. Yeah, we didn't, we didn't get the email working, so yes, yes, sir. even these web pages were built by you on Django. On Django. Or is this like a template then? Yeah, it's yeah. a bootstrap template, yeah, right? Yeah, admin is a default thing for Django. Okay. This is Django admin. This is like, it, it <coughs> nicely does it automatically, yeah. So, um, we have, we, we've added this to FA functionality as well. Once, once it has been registered, we get the full privileges. We have like my info, which was, we can, we can set the user name. And then uh, we have the email, uh, already the verified email is there. If we want to change and then the manage to a this is a QR code uh, section. Uh, once uh, you, you can you, for uh, you can use your Google Authenticator and uh, check out for the QR code and uh, it will actually register with the application. So I just I've just done it and I've got like a QR OTP QR over here. So all I have to do is enter that. So five six six nine three four. Yep, no tokens. It's worked. So this is basically I can disable it or I can generate backup tokens. Backup tokens. And I can see what my tokens are, right? And I can use this. And then if I log out, right? And I log back in now. It'll ask me for my two factor token. So, yeah, I cannot basically log in without my phone, effectively. Yeah, and now I can access my wallet. So which third party is using to generate? Uh, it's a Google. Um, it's it's basically generating a thirty-two hash key, converting that into basically a scannable of Google Authenticator, the app, or any other authenticator app. This Authy Google Authenticator, and maybe another one. Yeah. So it's it's yeah it, it's basically a Django library that we implemented. It's called Django Two FA. It was pretty pretty much out of the box because okay. it's. It's a pretty like you know common workflow that you'll be able to find everywhere. So, yeah, it was. We just had to basically plug it up and you know like make sure that the testing is working, the backup tokens are working, and uh, basically we just put in the URL and it worked. And, and now about deposit and withdrawal. So um, when the user clicks the withdraw button, moment of truth, and. <laughs> so here the user can enter the address they want to send the money to and the amount and when you click withdraw um, it actually calls a function from the block server which is called simple send which authenticates the token um, I mean the address of the um, user they want to send to whether it's registered or not and also the secret key of your current user whether it has money or not and then if it's successful then the money uh, sent to the other person. It's Satoshi's, right? The amount? Yes. Amount is, is, is this a withdrawal or a transfer? It's a withdrawal. It's a withdrawal to another address. We should have, we should have started with that's another transfer. wallet. Yeah. So it's a transfer. Transfer and withdrawal is the same thing then. We, we withdrawal, no, withdrawal, I would mean, is like converting into. To fiat. Oh, into like a. Okay, no, no, no. 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 I mean, so, in yeah. a wallet. So, so yeah, the assumption, the, the, the assumption is like fiat currency doesn't exist in our, in our exchange. And actually, right now, the current biggest exchange in the world, which was actually not there last year, was only eight months Binance. old, Binance, is only crypto to crypto. They don't deal with, like, money. Yeah. Like, basically, physical government money. You can withdraw it in some other currency. That's what it means. No, not in any other, not in, not in fear. No, 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 only in crypto. Some crypto currency. Yeah, currency. yeah, only crypto. So right now, we're withdrawing one coin. So yeah. we withdraw the faster currency. But you're going back to the Bitcoin value. No, 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 this is any Litecoin. He's withdrawing Litecoin to from li one Litecoin wallet to another Litecoin wallet. Yeah. And in fact, this value, this, will work th this value time. that you see right now yeah. is actually from the blockchain. So if we go to block cipher. Yeah. It's a bit confusing because that's Bitcoin. Exactly. But, okay. it's, but it is one. Okay, that's yeah. okay. That was just so if we look at uh, the address that I have, this is my public key. Right, as you know, this is my new public key. 
we don't show this publicly except for the in the deposits page so if i oh shit bad. so if we go to the block explorer Did you add some more money to it? How's that? No. Fee? Yeah. yeah, that's a good question. Is, is there a withdrawal fee? Or is that the average they're taking at that government bank? So at Possibly. The moment, at the moment, we're not explicitly charging a But the yeah. transaction is uh, not recorded in that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what he's trying to No, no, no. what I was trying to say is like the balance the we actually receive from the box cycle. The transaction, the key what you enter. The fee yeah. will be a mining fee, not so a withdrawal fee. Showing what right, right. Really so really needs. ideally we should get the same value back, but I guess. Minus the transaction value. Mm -hmm. Not the same right now. Um, so. Right now there's no fee that you can install on this. Because this is a balance, right? Right. Yeah. Anyway, so. Yeah, I'm going to withdraw and see if it works. <laughs> yeah, so that worked effectively and we can actually check that. This is the table. Yeah. It also generates a hash key which you can use it in a block cipher to check if your transaction is confirmed or not. So if we, um, now I'm going to switch it a bit. And so you got some command prompt stuff. So Yeah, so this is the sort of transaction we just created. Um, can you guys see? Uh, just try to... Yeah, so our actually fields actually have ID created at Coindex transaction ID, confirmation number of confirmations, the current user addresses, the transaction has that we're getting from Block Cipher, uh, then the two address, the amount, and the user ID. So if you notice over here, we have, again, a daytime stamp created at, we have a Coindex specific user uh, transaction ID over here. We have the address that we want to send it to. This is what I entered uh, as a user input. This is the transaction has that I received after the transaction is successful. So I'm saving it in my database. And then this is my the current user, my user who's initiating the transaction, their address, right? And this is the amount, which is 1000 Satoshis, Latoshis rather. And this is the user ID and the, which user is doing it. So we can prove that this transaction is successful by missing the transaction hash. Which is this one? Into the block explorer. So I'm going to copy this and then go to block paper. This is the block explorer. And then there you go. Received two minutes ago. So there is a there is, there will be a minor fee, yeah. I think it's 30 cents? Something like that. Yeah, so every... 34 cents. Every coin has is, is secured by miners. And right. So every transaction will be like a small fee. So, at confirmation, is that saying that this was not verified? So... It's not verified yet, yeah. On the blockchain. This, this is blockchain confirmation. So, so it's, how is it that you got to add? It always produces a hash, right? Whenever you create a transaction, it produces a hash. That hash is the reference for you to check whether or not that hash has been mined. Yeah, so which is what you did now. Yeah, so this, when, 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 it, when it gets mined by six people, by six miners, this transaction hash, yeah. what is this? This will be in the blockchain. Yeah, so this That's is, um, what, like, why do we have confirmations? It's to stop double spends. So someone can't spend the same coin twice. And um, even if you double spend, 
you, you will get two different transaction hashes, but only for one that has been confirmed six times will, will actually be, go on the hook. Be yeah. Yeah. So and the other one will actually be looked at as a double spend. Yeah, so this is essentially temporary until this is confirmed. And then um, if we go back to our home page and, uh, you know, go back to the wallet uh, and we have another functionality, obviously, to deposit. So if I want to deposit into my address as a user, I get my address that I can send it to. And, uh, and this is user specific, so like, and coin specific, so obviously this is like coin address and if I go back, I can get my Bitcoin address as well. And that's my Bitcoin well, address. Did your, your wallet update it to represent this withdrawal? Sorry? Your wallet updated to represent this withdrawal, right? Yeah. So uh, we have another thing, which is basically uh, uh, workers on the background. We've written four functions where uh, it basically communicates to the blockchain, takes the data and saves it to our database. So the four functions that we actually call for is the balance, uh, the transaction count, uh, the input, the how much is that particular address is received and the output, yeah. how much that particular address so is sent out. This, this so, Bitcoin value, we don't have 100 Bitcoins in our exchange, right? This is just hard coded, um, but we would want Obviously, the approximate value to represent the total balance for each each coin. Um, so that that's just when we run out of time. For the, yes. The back so I, and I was just kind of just when I was saying all the functions, those functions actually we've been able to actually wrap it. Um, and Anand was quite monumental in this wrap it around a worker. We have got a that is queue with the background that's actually running every ten minutes. That's actually doing this and fetching for all the users every time every ten minutes. Um, yeah. Also, we ran into like a block cipher API limit, so yeah, we're not doing it. We're doing it manually right now, but yeah, we have to kind of figure out how to work, um, you know, circumvent around it and how to get that working. So, uh, using yeah. the API. Okay. I mean, obviously, using something more low level, like you know, because that API is a bit high level and like you know has limits. They 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 run a business basically, and the reason why like our page actually, if you notice our our, our home, every time I click on home, it takes a long time to load. It's because actually it's making those API calls to get the balances and stuff. Also, even the averages from the, from yeah. the same. API. Exactly, and it's like a web API, so it will take long, and you know you have to kind of like get some customization and then sort of, uh, you know, sort of uh, make it more optimized. Like you know, load it maybe on the lazy side and load the values afterwards. But yeah, I mean uh, that's what we've done so far. And uh, in terms of like implementing an exchange, I think. Uh, that's probably the next step, uh, next you know, big step. Uh, next big, big step, monumental step. Uh, the exchange got like a lot of, uh, lot of moving parts, but we kind of understand how like, you know, an order book works, you know, we started understanding how that works. So well, what I was talking about, the background queue worker that we have, that will be monumental to our exchange as well, because, you know, you'll be push pushing all the orders to that queue and, you know, that queue will be basically represent what that order book and you have like a, you know, sort of buy and sell table, that's what it represents. An exchange is quite simple actually, it's just two tables, one buy and one sell table, and whenever a new order is put in, at the time of that new order, you would just match any older orders, right? And um, once they match, you just update the tables, it's actually not, not that complicated. But it, you just need enough volume and enough backend to to get it all working. So, so you're looking for one handle block order. Pardon? Are you looking for one handle block order for instability? Right. Yeah. So um. So you're talking about like partial partially filled orders, right? Yeah. So that's something else we've got the logic solved for, um, but we just haven't. Would we also have to communicate to other platforms? Or is it just to manage your own model? It's just our own platform. Um, like our price can be ra radically different to the price of any other exchange. It doesn't, it's completely a question mark. Uh, no, I mean, it is the way it is now. It's just that the spreads are much smaller. Like 
the injection time is on the primary. Exactly, yeah. We can actually, if we had enough money, we could have used that API and done that in arbitrage. We were talking about this the other day. Yeah, but we need a lot of volume to make some money on that. Not really. <laughs> There's a there's a there's a transaction there's a there's a there's a C plus plus library that already does arbitrage trading on Bitcoin only. Yeah, only Bitcoin only though. But there's only four four there's. But it's it's uh, it's only supports like four exchanges and uh, it's pretty good though. It's maintained. It's quite quite up to date. Yeah. yeah, but it's only Bitcoin also, so that's also another thing. And your spread, the the, the area where you find the spread is you know in developing countries like in India. Yeah, like India has like a lot of spread like in terms of the values. But that's one thing. Mm -hmm. Cool. Any questions? We'll be happy to answer. So what are the next steps? Well, uh, first of all, like a major refactor, a lot of like stuff that we've cut corners. Uh, and then, you know, obviously uh, test it out as a proper functioning wallet, add more money. I mean, rather not money, uh, add more currencies. Uh, the way we've kind of built the exchange is in such a way is that, you know, we've created like a base class for every currency and, you know, it's just easy to inherit that class uh, when we add a new currency and, you know, just add functionalities across it. Um, Something we find kind of tricky is, you know, obviously like so actually creating those withdrawals and stuff. You know, we find a lot of like, you know, where to redirect the user afterwards, you know. Error handling is something that is quite important as well that we've realized that, you know, we've not covered a lot. You know, it's just, we, we showed you the happy path. <laughs> you know, what, what, what if someone goes wrong, right? And, you know, like we need to be able to handle that.